I believe in the soul, the small woman's back, the hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, and that the Phillies Nation podcast is coming at you right now. Yeah, we're talking catchers. We're talking Chooch. We're talking Cameron. We're talking Jorge. We're talking baseball. The Phillies Nation podcast is live now. Phillies Nation, welcome to the podcast. This is episode number seven. I'm Tim Malcolm, the editorial director of philliesnation.com. Go to philliesnation.com for all of your Phillies news, opinion, rumors, and more. You can find Phillies Nation also on Facebook at facebook.com slash philliesnation, Twitter at philliesnation, and Instagram at philliesnation underscore. That's philliesnation, and then for Instagram, an underscore. The podcast can be found on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker. We are on TuneIn Radio. iHeartRadio, I believe, is still in the works. You can also find us on YouTube at our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Phillies Nation. So, today's podcast is going to be about catchers as the Phillies welcome back one of the greats in their franchise history, Chooch. Carlos Ruiz is coming back with the team that we all knew he would end up with, the Seattle Mariners. <laughs> I wonder what he's doing in Seattle. I wonder if he's out, like, going around in uh, the market out there and maybe climbing mountains or going to Olympic National. I don't know. But <laughs> it's interesting that Chooch is out in Seattle, of all places. I just can't imagine Chooch in Seattle, but he's there. He's not really playing too well right now with the Mariners. We'll talk about that a little bit. Later on the podcast, Kirsten Swanson is coming on to talk about Chooch and memories of Chooch. There are so many great ones from the 2008 World Series final pitch to the no-hitters and perfect games to clutch hits off of our old friend Jonathan Broxton and much more. We also have the guy who runs Phillies Nation. He's my boss, Brian Michael. He's on today. And we're going to talk about where Chooch stands in Phillies history. Uh, Does he rate above or below guys like Darren Dalton, Mike Lieberthal, Bob Boone? In the hallowed halls of catching uh, catching history in Philly's history, where does Chooch stand? So we'll talk about that. We'll start with what's happening with the team right now. and eh, They're not having a great time of it right now. They uh, came off of that sweep against the Dodgers and had to go to Wrigley to face the Cubs, and it started really well with a big win that first night Monday in a rainy, soggy Wrigley. They came out to a giant lead and never looked back, 10-2 the final, or 10-4 the final, whatever the final was there. And then they really tried hard to win another game in that series, but the Cubs just kept scoring runs, and it would typically evaporate around the fifth, sixth, or seventh innings with Pete McCannon maybe not leaving in a starter long enough or taking out a or leaving in a starter too long or just it's it's tough, right? It's tough to make those decisions in the moments, especially when you got a lineup with Chris Bryant and Anthony Rizzo and Ben Zobrist and Wilton Contreras and all these other great batters facing you. Baez getting home runs. I mean, it's hard. The Cubs are a really good team. So I have to look long view. I do think some of Pete McCannon's moves are suspect, and we see them kind of add up as the years going on, as the Phillies become a little bit more of a contending team. They're not contending yet, but we see that there are issues, right? McCannon has had some issues with bullpen management and his rotation, but they're facing good teams, and good teams win. One of the things that's troubling, though, is the starting pitching, which started out very well to start the season. It's cooled off a little bit, but the thing that most concerns everybody is the home runs. And that's been the big topic over the last couple weeks, but especially last week. The Phillies right now have given up the most home runs of any pitching staff in baseball. I think it's 48 at this point. They are on pace to potentially break the record, the major league record for most home runs given up in a season. That's incredible. And it's not as if Citizens Bank Park is playing amazingly small this year. The Phillies aren't hitting as many home runs. Of course, they don't have the home run hitters 
that other teams have. But really what it is is, A, they're facing teams with some really good home run hitters, and they're facing home run hitting teams, right? The Cubs, the Mets, the Nationals. I mean, you're facing guys like you know, Cespedes, Daniel Murphy, Zimmerman, who's having a great year right now, Ryan Zimmerman, Jason Wirth, Bryce Harper. Over the Cubs, you have Bryant and Rizzo and Baez. It's just on and on and on and on. They faced a lot of good home run hitting teams. And I think that'll cool off a little bit when we get into May, June, and the Phillies face some of the more inept teams, right? However, they do give up a lot of home runs regardless. When they face the Braves and the Marlins, they were still giving up solo home runs. Part of that, I think, has to do with the catching and the pitch calling. And we'll talk about that with Kirsten Swanson in a little bit, Cameron Rupp, and how he frames pitches and how he calls pitches. We have some interesting stats on the framing early on in the season. You won't, maybe you will believe them, but you won't want to hear them, I guess. But that definitely takes a little bit. There's a little bit about calling games that's in this stat when there are two strikes on a hitter, and this happens a lot with two strikes and two outs, and the pitch is called for maybe a fastball somewhere in the zone, and the pitch misses, and it gets killed 350 feet, 400 feet. You could blame the pitcher. You can also blame the catcher. You can blame the manager, the pitching coach. But there are levels here of not an aptitude, but lack of strategy in these moments. And I think part of it, too, is the pitching, right? The, the pitch framing is one thing. The pitch calling is one thing. But the pitching itself, the Phillies, if we recall last season, were really, really good at strikeouts per nine. They had the record for the most strikeouts per nine in the first month of the season last year. Remember that? Nine strikeout games, ten strikeout games, relievers, starters, they were all pumping strikeouts. This year, not so much. The Phillies right now have a 7.37 strikeout per nine, which is 25th in baseball. Compared to first in baseball at this time last year. Right now, uh, last year was 8.14 for the whole season. One of the top ratings in all of baseball. But this year, 7.37. Definitely down. Part of that is the fact that they don't have some of their pitchers healthy right now. Noel is hurt and he had the MRI, but he should be coming back. That's what we've been told. Clay Buckholz got injured early. They've had a lot of up and down movement from the, from the, from the AAA roster to the majors. Jared Eikhoff is doing his thing, obviously, 33 strikeouts and 36 innings. Vince Velasquez is 34, but only in 33 innings because he has not gotten through games that much. And then there's Hellickson, who only has 17 strikeouts and 38 innings. What happened to Hellickson, who was throwing that curveball for strikeouts early last year? It's a different pitcher. It's interesting. And I don't know what the difference is necessarily, and I think some of it is how to call the game, and Cameron Rupp has something to do with that. But again, part of it is just the pitching is a little different than it was. Hellickson's not the pitcher he was last year to start the year. He's been more efficient, but I think at the expense of some really tough spots, especially in the sixth and seventh innings when he's supposed to get through innings and get, get through games, it's not happening the way he'd like it to. And that's why the Phillies right now are experiencing such a problem with home runs coming, leaving the park. They should be getting strikeouts and instead – they have to turn their necks and see a three-run lead evaporate or a one-run lead become a three-run deficit or a two-run deficit. It's not the way to play baseball. It should normalize a little bit, but right now, it's not fun to watch. What is fun to watch, however, is Aaron Altair, and he hit the big home run on Sunday, a huge three-run pinch hit home run to tie the game against the Nationals. Then, of course, the Phillies won it in the 10th inning. Altair is having a great season, as we know, and we've, we've talked about it, and it's still happening. 65 at-bats for Altair. He has 22 hits, and 11 of them are extra base hits. 11 of the 65 at-bats, and I think it's something like 79 or 80 plate appearances. That's basically every two games you're getting an extra base hit from Aaron Altair. He's hitting 338, 427 on base percentage, 631 slug. Yes, small sample size. We should always remember that at this point of the year. But man, Altair is killing it. Plus, he provides great defense. Plus, he's very good on the base pass. He has some speed. I think we're getting to a point now where he has to play every day no matter what. And if this season goes well for Altair, you have to think that he might be part of the future. Maybe the Phillies can sign him to a four- to five-year deal, bring that average 
money per year down a little bit, a little bit of a team-friendly deal, get Altair signed through his arbitration years. That could happen if he has a good season this year. He's playing well. Keep him in the lineup. See what he does. Maybe we'll have a really, really good season from a guy that we didn't quite expect to have that kind of a season. So again, the show today, we have Kirsten Swanson just in a moment. Brian Michael will come up in a little bit to talk about the history of Philly's catchers. But now let's talk about what's happening with the big team right now. Kirsten Swanson. Cameron Rupp is Cameron Rupp right now with the Phils, and Andrew Knapp is hitting pretty well, maybe not getting as much time as we hope. And then there's Jorge Alfaro in AAA. He's playing really well. And I have Kirsten Swanson from philliesnation.com on to talk about the current Phillies catching situation, and this is our catcher episode. Kirsten, first thing first, if you had your druthers, as Ruben Amaro Jr. would say, uh, who would be your catcher right now in the Phillies? Like, if you, if, if, like, forget service time, forget salaries, forget anything. If you had to pick what the catcher for the Phillies would be right now, who would it be? If it was no service time and all that wasn't an issue, then my gut would say Jorge Alfaro, just because he seems like a really exciting player. And right now where the Phillies are, I think we kind of need that exciting player to kind of turn the page and say, okay, he is the guy. He's going to be the catcher when the Phillies are in the playoffs again. So my gut says Jorge Alfaro, but I know that is not a possibility. I don't want it to be a possibility, but in the dream world, it would be Jorge Alfaro. Well, I, I bring that up because uh, Bob Brookover, who was a Phillies former beat writer, uh, he writes for the Inquirer, philly.com, and he had a column this past week about how the Yankees are obviously playing well, and they have a really good offense, and they have guys who are like seven foot tall hitting monster home runs, but they have Aaron Judge, of course, uh, outfielder, first baseman, whatever he is, uh, doing his thing, and then Gary Sanchez, of course, he's hurt right now, but uh, was up last year for most of the season and was unbelievable when he came up. And so he's using that logic to say that Jorge Alfaro should be up right now, also Reese Hoskins. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a correlation there. Like, I, to me, at least it sounds like these are two different things with the Yankees and uh, Gary Sanchez and the Phillies and Jorge Alfaro, right? For sure. For sure. I mean, for one, Alfaro is, don't get us wrong here. I mean, he's having a great season at the plate. Uh, this is before, I think, Sunday's games. He's hitting 330 for the Iron Pigs, which is his best so far as a minor leaguer uh, over the course of his entire career. He's slugging 500. And the power's there a little bit. I mean, definitely, it's all there. The offense, not even a problem. But the game calling and the receiving and the fielding, what, like, for Alfaro, are you, as a fan, would you want to see a catcher who's not – that developed defensively or not as developed defensively on the team and just let him wait in triple a no i would want him he needs his bats he needs his time behind the plate in triple a i think he even said it himself that he was looking forward going to the season to play almost a full year down there because he he recognizes he realizes that he needs that time behind the plate to sharpen up and especially with the young staff pitching staff that we have in the big leagues right now you don't need a catcher behind the plate who's trying to figure things out himself um that wouldn't work well well, I bring that up because <laughs> the guy we have right now in the majors, Cameron Rock. Now, he's hitting the ball fine right now. He's, he's last couple weeks, really last week, has been pretty good for him. Before Sunday's game, and he actually didn't play on Sunday, he was hitting 247, 349 OBP, which is respectable, very good. Uh, 466 slugging percentage, a couple home runs, he's got seven doubles. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing offensively. Now, behind the plate, uh, there's a website called Stat Corner. They do some great work, statcorner.com. They do a thing called the Catcher Report, and they measure how well a catcher frames pitches. And it's still mm -hmm. sort of a science that's being figured out, and sample sizes be damned. But who is the worst catcher in 2017 as far as pitch framing? Take a guess. Oh, man, I'm going to take a wild guess and say Cameron Rupp. You would be right, because Cameron <laughs> Rupp right now – uh, he has a he has a measure called runs against. Uh, he basically tries to figure out how many runs across the entire season a catcher would be giving up because his pitch framing was bad. Cameron is at a negative seven point seven. So what he's saying is the Phillies have apparently given up seven more runs because Cameron Rupp is behind the plate. This is against average, okay? So against the average everyday catcher because Cameron Rupp is catching the ball and not doing it well. The Phillies have given up seven more runs this season. That's unbelievable. 
that's wild. And I want to, I'm curious to see who, you know, which pitchers. I mean, I'm just thinking some of the pitches that he calls for Vince Velasquez and that just are moonshots out of the park. Again, it's, you know, Vince Velasquez not locating his pitches, but still, I'm just curious to see what the breakdown even further of that would be. Yeah, and, and he also measures the amount of calls that a catcher gets. So, you know, if a catcher frames really well, let's say, like, Manny right. Molina, he'll get more calls for strikes, correct? So for sure. So, Cameron Ropp, again, the worst in baseball, 58 calls that have not gone his way because his framing is not good enough. And it's insane how many, I mean, and, and you can see it. You know, you see in Hellickson starts where he, he throws a pitch on the outside corner that just does not get called a strike. You see it when Velasquez is throwing a curveball and it doesn't hit, and it maybe could have been on the lower end of the zone, but it wasn't. The nuances. So, so again, I ask you, Cameron Ruff is hitting the ball fine. His defense fielding, his, his whole sort of framing game, all that is a little suspect. Are you happy with the fact that he's the catcher right now, and are, are you, will you live with it even if it's at the expense of the pitching staff? I can live with it just because we're in such a holding pattern in every, almost every other position on the field that – you know, what are their options, really? Do we, I mean, you can throw Nap out there and kind of see what he, what he's all about, but Jorge Alfaro is right now the catcher of the future. So I would agree. I would think getting Nap more playing time for sure. I think I saw something this morning that Ruff is on course to get, to start 117 games would be the most since Mike Lieberthal. That's just absurd. There's no reason for him to get that many no. starts. So yeah, I would, I would want Nap to get in there a little bit more just to see who is going to be the backup catcher when Jorge Alfaro is the starting catcher. Um, so right now we're just in a holding pattern, and it's kind of, I don't know what else, what yeah. else, what other option there is. Well, McC- Pete McCannon was saying that, and and he kind of hinted at the fact that Andrew Knapp would be getting more playing time, especially against right-handed pitching because Knapp's a lefty, and it makes more sense. Knapp's actually a switch hitter, but it makes more sense for him to get the at bats against right-handed pitching and, and get Rupp out of the games there. Knapp right now, going into Sunday, is hitting 296 with a 387 OBP, 519 slug. These are very short sample sizes, 31 plate appearances. But the guy clearly has a clue of what to do with the plate. So how much worse could he be from Cameron Rupp? I don't. I think it's very negligible. So to me, I, I'm with you. I think Jorge Alfaro is probably the catcher of the future. And next season, opening day, he's the guy. He should be the guy. But why not give Andrew Knapp a real chance here? Because what happens if he plays really well? oh, maybe he can, you know, go to some other team who needs catching and maybe we can get one or two pieces back for Andrew Knapp, someone that going into the season I think we kind of thought, oh, he doesn't really have much of a future in Philadelphia anyways, right? I mean, doesn't it make sense? For sure, and I think the Phillies have that luxury now that you see last year with Tommy Joseph, what's, what could they couldn't have lost anything by calling him up and then he wound up performing really well. And the same thing with Rupp to a certain extent last year when he took over full time for Carlos Ruiz. Um, what can you lose? You might as well just throw him out there. If he can be a viable backup as for, to Jorge Alfaro, or if he can be a trade piece, I mean, there's nothing to lose, and the Phillies have that luxury right now. Which is good, yeah. And, and to me, if I'm Matt Klintak, I'm looking at Rupp and Knapp and saying, these are guys who can be traded. Not this year, obviously, with Rupp, because I think we need him sort of in the mix. But if Knapp, you know, get him on a hitting streak or something, get him kind of interest, you know, along the majors, Maybe there's something there. And then at the end of the season, then you move her up for something. And now you have Alfaro. You bring in a really good veteran catcher who can frame pitches and work with pitchers. And, right. and maybe it got, you know, like a good start for Jorge, who obviously we're comparing him to, in some ways, Benito Santiago. And in some ways, we're comparing him to uh, uh, Pudge Rodriguez. And, it, you know, right. great names. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting, but to me, I think you're right. I think we are in agreement here. we can't, we got to wait on Alfaro as, as much as it sucks. We have to wait on him. <laughs> um, all right, so Kirsten, we'll be back in a little bit. We'll talk about maybe our favorite catcher, I think, of, of the last many years, Carlos Ruiz. Uh, see you in a little bit. Sounds good. Who knows if Cameron Rupp or Andrew Knapp or Jorge Alfaro will ever be considered one of the greatest catchers in Philly's history. The jury is still out. But the guy coming back to Citizens Bank Park this week, Carlos Ruiz, certainly has a place in Philly's history. And that's what we're here to debate. I have Brian Michael, the founder and CEO of philliesnation.com, on the phone with me. And we're going to talk a little bit about Chooch. Uh, Brian, first off, do you... uh, Let's just lay it out here. Is Carlos Ruiz the greatest catcher in Philly's history? Well, first off, Tim, thanks for having me on. Uh, I would say it's down to him 
and Mike Lieberthal, uh, since Lieberthal has a lot of the all-time records. But when you look at Chuch's contribution, especially in the playoffs, especially with the World Series win, um, I think he would get the slight edge. So you would you would put Chuch over, let's say, like Darren Dalton, even like so. You you don't even have him. Like it's 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 him or him or Levy. Uh yeah. When when we're looking um, for best all time catchers or I guess biggest contribution, you know, there's Chuch certainly wasn't the best offensive catcher the Phillies had, but those intangibles with the playoffs included, I think, uh, gives them the nod. Okay, because I would I I think I'd probably put Dalton above both Levy and Chooch. And I think I know what you're saying, because I, with you, you know, having a strong leader, having a defensive mind behind the plate is, is sometimes more important than having an offensive catcher. So I, I can see that, but I don't know. I, I let, let, Let's kind of dig in a little bit well, here. I'll give, you, I'll, Good. I'll give uh, Chooch a little bit of credit, too, because... Like you said, he needs to have that sort of communication with the pitchers, which is important, and I think we all knew he had that, and he caught four no-hitters to boot. Uh, but you think about it, too, English is his second language. So for him to be able to do that uh, on top of not being an uh, uh, English native speaker, uh, I think is pretty impressive as well. No, you're absolutely right. And Well, the true story is fascinating. It was it Gary Smith, I think, who wrote the Sports Illustrated cover back in 2010 or 11, no, 11 when he caught the, the four aces, you know, five aces, Joe Blanton. But then uh, the great story about how Ruiz had to basically work through everything in Panama and get to the point where people recognized him as an actual baseball player. And then when the Phillies were looking at him, he wasn't a catcher at the time. He was, what, like a third baseman or something like that? Right, right. And so he got to the point where they said, no, maybe you're better behind the plate. So it even took him years to be behind the plate and to learn and master that position and then be able to work with pitchers. And I think you're right. I mean, there's, there's a difference between a Darren Dalton or even a Mike Lieberthal who sort of came in at that position and knew all the ins and outs and really had a head start on a lot of other guys. And a Carlos Ruiz who came out of really nowhere and was drafted out of Panama or was selected out of Panama from the Phillies, and he had to work, work, work. So, okay, I, I get it. Um, so let's put it's it this way. Too Richie, uh, it's funny. Richie Ashburn had the opposite uh, path to baseball. He started out as a catcher because his dad thought it was the easiest position to get drafted in. Uh, but once this, his coaches saw Richie's speed, they they moved him center field. Uh, almost immediately. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's one of the easier positions to get if you can do it. Yeah. And I think that's the trick. No, absolutely. It, what, what was it, too? It was, um, was it his size which made him a catcher, Chooch? Did, did they, did, didn't they feel like he just couldn't hack it as an infielder? He didn't have the power or something like that? Yeah, yeah the, the speed, the agility, yeah. I think. Uh, and and you, you see that, but he could block the ball. He could call a game. Um, and he did have uh, some pop when he needed. So, yeah, the pop came especially in 2012 when he had that 16 home run season. It's a little bit of an outlier in his whole career because you look at those numbers, and I, I later on in the podcast talked with Kirsten Swanson about this too, but 16 home runs, he had a 540 slugging percentage, which is almost 100 points over any other slugging percentage he ever had in his career. It's amazing what he did that season. Um and then you compare that to Darren Dalton, because I, I still think Dalton, to me, is the best catcher in Philly's history. The offensive numbers seem to just overshadow what everybody else did. Dalton had those numbers for a couple of years, for sure. But Chooch, he built to that place. He actually got to a place where he could be a real offensive producer. And I don't think we ever thought of him in that vein, especially in 2007-08. Certainly not. You can see where, his, where he batted in the lineup, too. Uh, compared to Dalton and even Lieberthal for that matter, but I but I put Darren Dalton at so the 2000 we did the original 100 greatest Phillies in 2008 and 9, and that was my list and I put Darren Dalton at that time at 37, and I put Bob Boone at 32. I would totally not only change that but I would drop Booney down quite a bit. Um, Bob Boone was not necessarily a, an offensive stalwart there. He was always sort of the eight hitter in that lineup. But he did have the leadership qualities and the defensive qualities that Chooch has. So I would I would put Chooch and Boone in the same area. But 
what you're saying about Chooch's ability to sort of learn and, and, and be able to kind of grow and develop. So how much more, you know, let's put them on like a 100 greatest sort of list. If Booney's around like, let's say, 60, how much further up would Chooch be from that? Sure. Uh, well, I was uh, looking at, at the Phillies Nation um, updated version that Ian did a couple years later, and, and that's exactly where he moved Boone to number 60. Um, he did rank Chooch at 2 and Dutch at 34. Um, I could certainly see them flipped. He also had Jack Clements, uh, the yeah. catcher back in 1880s, 1890s, um, who was, you know, uh, played thousands of games with the with the Phillies, so um, you might as well throw him in there as well. But yeah, I would say mid to upper thirties all time, um, and that's where the highest catcher would fall. You know, I don't think the Phillies had any certainly Hall of Fame type catchers, uh, especially on the offensive side, like um, you know Mike Piazza more recently, or um, you know even more Campanella. But thirties, mid thirties, forties. Um, I think that's a lot of where the catchers fit uh, for the Phils. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, you know, in, in the in Ian Riccoboni's list, I think he had Dalton, yeah, 33, 34, something like that. Lieberthal was in the mid 40s. Chooch was in the mid 40s. And I think if you would, if you were to flip Chooch into the 30s, I think that's totally fine. I would probably put him in the 40s to this day. Um, but I think we're we're kind of in the same vein with the fact that none of these guys are Hall of Fame talents. But one thing that is kind of interesting with Phillies catchers over time is when the Phillies are good, they typically have a really good catcher behind the plate. And when they're not good, they don't. Like, like, yes. it, like it seems like the catchers for all the good Phillies teams make these lists because the Phillies find somebody who they can throw in there for 10 years and be the franchise catcher. That's pretty remarkable. Yes, absolutely. When you look at the Phillies kind of all time with the 50 team, Bob Boone, all throughout the late 70s and 80s. And, you know, we've had a, a pretty good run recently with Ruiz, Lieberthal, you know, Dalton, and Boone in there. Um, you had just a few others, Bo Diaz, uh, Benny Santiago, Todd Pratt here and there. But we've had a good run recently, and like you were saying earlier, we're in that transition phase right now with the 2017 Phillies. Who's going to be that next consistent player behind the plate for eight, nine, ten years with the Phils. And, you know, maybe how far is that guy? If he gets called up soon, this could be his, his first couple days of it. Yeah, and, and we I talked about that with uh, Kirsten Swanson earlier in the program that it, I, to me it seems like Cameron Rupp is going to be the guy probably the rest of the year. And Andrew Knapp should get more playing time, I think, because there's no reason why the Phillies shouldn't explore his value right now. But Jorge Alfaro, you know, maybe September gets a call up, and that's it. Because he has only one option year left. This is the option year. So I think the Phillies want to use it in the minor leagues and get him the training that he needs. And then when the year's over, AAA, move him up to the big club and just let him go from there. And who knows? If he's, if he's going to be a 10- to 15-year franchise cornerstone, that gives the Phillies something that they can rely on behind the plate. That's, that's going to be a pretty good thing. I, I wanted to look up Benito Santiago's numbers because you mentioned Benito Santiago in what, 1997, was it? He hit 30, 31 home runs for the uh, Well, you knew him already from the Padre because he had that funny way he, he crouched behind home plate. So when he finally came to the Phils, it was someone, you know, that you already were familiar with. And then the offensive explosion, I mean, yeah, those were the lean years for the Phillies and definitely a reason to come out to the vet. You know, back in those days, there were probably more feral cats in attendance than humans. <laughs> so it was fun for that year. He had 30 homers. I think um, Stan Lakata has the Phillies record with 32 back in the 50s, um, who was also a pretty catcher, him and Dutch, um, and then Benny that one year. Um, but, yeah, a lot of fun. One of the few reasons to come out to the park that those times. How many, how many years did Stan Lakata play for the Phillies? Lakata, I believe, was there... He came in after um, Andy Semenik, and, and he was there just for a couple of years, 56 to 58, so through the, those three years. Um, yeah, I'm looking at his numbers here. I mean, he was, well, he was on the Phillies for quite a while in the, in the, in the 50s, up until 57, 58. 
Um, and he hit basically all of his 116 home runs. Is he is he, um, is he like one of these under recognized guys? I mean, he played in such a weird period for the Phillies in the fifties after that Wiz Kid season. He really came alive. Yeah, I mean, the Phillies have a lot of players like that because they had a lot of seasons like that. Yeah. You know, there were whole decades where players probably were underrated um, since they didn't get the publicity of some of the other more successful teams. But yeah, Lapata, I know Ian had him in at forty eight, but the Phillies, yeah, are dotted with some of those players. Spud Davis, one of the Phillies' best hitting catchers uh, from in the 20s and 30s. And, again, that's when the Phillies were bad for about 30 years in a row. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I actually looked up some of the, the catchers, and there's – Spud Davis was a good one, also had a funny name. Uh, but there were plenty of catchers in Phillies history with funny names, including Choo Choo Coleman, <laughs> Dixie, Dixie Parker, uh, Pickles Dillhofer. Yeah, Pickles is the man. Right? Uh, Peaches Graham and Dink O'Brien Dink from 1923 team. <laughs> yeah, the 1923 team was probably filled with a lot of guys named Dink. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that was Dixie Parker also behind the plate that year. So that was a fun uh, lineup to fill out. That's fantastic. Well, another fun named uh, Phillies catcher in history, Clay Dalrymple, and more popular, obviously, and, and a bit of a better player. He was on the 1964 team, and he was known really for being a great defensive catcher. Um, who is the greatest defensive catcher in Phillies history? Would it be like a Dal Ripple? I know we didn't see him play, but would it be him or Bob Boone, or would it be Chooch? I mean, who do you think would be that guy? Um, I do think uh, it would be Dal Ripple. I know that he, uh, according to Fangraphs, he saved – over 104 runs defensively in his career, which was uh, far and away the most in Philly's history. Uh, so he, from the defensive side, yeah, Clay Darrymple definitely, I think, was the best. Um, I don't know how he did with the pitchers in terms of calling the games. Uh, certainly there was probably fewer pitchers to manage back in those days. And I think Darrymple loses a bit, though, because, like you said, he was part of that 64 team, and he was... Uh, one of the guys that kind of slumped there towards the end of the season and uh, probably didn't endear himself. Well, he wasn't great. necessarily a big-time hitting catcher to begin with. He had a two thirty three average with the Phillies, so it's not as if he should have been expected to be a big-time contributor. Yeah. No, certainly not. And there were any number of things that could have gone differently for the Phillies to have won, and they and they all went wrong for him. Uh, so Mike Lieberthal is an interesting one because – I mean, he was the catcher of, of our youth for the most part and had a couple of very interesting seasons where he hit over 300 at one point. He had 30 home runs at one point. He was really all over the map. Um, where would you rank him sort of overall on a top 100 sort of list? We've had him in different places in the, in the two iterations. Uh, but also, do you think Lieberthal deserved to be on the Wall of Fame? He got that. He was enshrined a couple of years back on the Wall of Fame. Is he the kind of guy that you think should have been on the Wall of Fame? Um, well, that's a good question. I'll take that, the Wall of Fame one first. Uh, I do think he was one of the best Phillies catchers of all time. Like I said earlier, he's got a lot of the all-time um, records, especially on the offensive side. At this point, I would not have put him on the Wall of Fame. I do think there are a few players from back in the 1800s, early 1900s, that were probably more deserving. Um, a few of the ones we even mentioned that are catchers, like Dalrymple, perhaps, or Spud Davis, even. So, I but, think there's... But who's coming out to see Spud Davis getting in exactly, the Wall of Fame, right? exactly, exactly, and that's part of the reason Pete Rose is going on this year. I mean, that, that, that's going to be a big weekend uh, for a lot of fans here in Philly. But, yeah, he was around for such a long time uh, in the 90s, early 2000s. Everyone remembers him. He was such a good guy, you know, a uh, stable force back there, a nice guy, never really rocked the boat. So a fan favorite, and I can see why they put him on the Wall of Fame. And I guess that's what the Wall of Fame is, is more for. Right. Maybe it isn't necessarily the best of all time. It could be fan favorites. You know, Jim Tomey was on last year, and uh, as much as I like him, uh, certainly as a fan favorite, I probably would have picked a few other players before him. Sure. Uh, and Lieberthal, you know, uh, yes, fan favorite and all that, but I think 
one of the things about Lieberthal that's interesting is some of the numbers that he put up while – he had some down years, quote unquote. He actually put up numbers that these days I think would be very highly respected. And I look at his on base percentage as kind of the first indicator because that has been the most, you know, people talk about on base percentage first when it comes to uh, advanced statistics, even though it's sort of a gateway. But if you look at his career, I mean, 363 in 1999, 352 in 2000, 349 in 2002, 373 in, in 2003, and I think that was the year that he hit over 300. He had 313 that year. So he clearly was better than I think we had remembered him to be because he was at the end of that lineup with David Bell, and there was always that, oh, here comes Bell and Lieberthal to make it a 1-2-3 inning with the pitcher. But he yeah. actually seemed to be a better offensive contributor than I think we remember. Yeah, I would agree. You know, that was around the same time of Pudge Rodriguez and certainly Mike Piazza. Yeah, you had some big names up there. Yeah, sure. Right. So they, those were tough shoes to fill, and – Again, there wasn't like there was much other power in the lineup protecting Leibs, but he certainly did do a good job to get on base. Like I said, consistent. You know, he was a model of consistency, um, staying healthy for the most part, um, having that one really good season in uh, in 1999. He hit 31 home runs that year, um, just like you were saying Benito um, did. Um, you know, so again, very stable. Above average, but I wouldn't say the greatest uh, offensive catcher, uh, certainly. But um, the number of years um, is really what ha- Leaves has going for him. Now, we've had good catchers in Philly's history, like Lieberthal and Chooch and Darren Dalton and Bob Boone and Semenik and Dalrymple and such and so on. Do you have a favorite, m- you know, mediocre catcher? I don't, I don't want to put it the wrong way here, but do you have a favorite, like, backup catcher? Uh, in, in recent Phillies history, I mean, we've had so many interesting stories in backup catcherdom. Do you have a favorite? Sure. sure. Well, not that I was around, but in 1966, Bob Euchre was the Phillies' backup catcher. Yes, he was. And everyone loves his voice, uh, so I certainly am a fan of him. Um, you know, Tim McCarver, he was a little bit of both, but mostly a starting catcher. But even more recently, I would say Rod Barajas. Is Wait, one like Rod Barajas? <laughs> Rod Barajas, because he was a Phillies killer later in his career. But he killed he the nothing. Phillies when he was on the Phillies, too. Yeah, exactly. He was a killer when he was on the team. He did nothing when he was with the Phillies, and as soon as he leaves, he's just, you know, go four for six with four homers or something like that. And totally given up on a play, man. Totally yeah. given up on a play. Yeah. Um, so Barajas certainly... Todd Pratt was another fan favorite, especially because he did two tours with the Phils. Yeah. Uh, so everyone loved Tank uh, back there. So those two, I would say, uh, I, I like Todd Pratt. He was, you know, our perpetual backup catcher for a while. Yeah, now Todd Pratt is one of the better backup catchers, I think, you could find out there. I mean, he had some power. You know, he caught a pretty decent game, well-respected, obviously, you know, a player's player, you know, a guy that everybody kind of loved. Um, my favorite, though, is I'm sure a lot of people's favorite, Sal Fasano. Uh, you know, someone who came to the Phillies for basically a hot second, but when he was with the Phillies for that hot second, he was the best thing in town. And yes. this was right before the Phillies got really good, and Fasano was actually part of one of the trades that helped kind of reload the Phillies. Or not reload the Phillies, but reset the Phillies back then. But... um yeah, he played, what, 50 games uh, for the Phillies that year and may have hit something like two or three home runs, if that, but it was the Fu Manchu, and it was the fact that he was one of right. the nicest people ever that really made him popular. Sal's pals. Yes, he was one of the last uh, fan groups roaming the park. Yeah. Sal's with the Fu Manchus, exactly. And I was about to look up his uh, stats, but then I got a virus on my phone, so that's good. But, okay. um, and then, of course, Chris Coast, who, you know, came in in 2007, I believe. And it was actually around the same time that Rod Barajas completely laid out and stopped caring about a throw home. Yeah. Uh, but Coast basically won over a backup job at that point and went on to basically hit like 350 or so the rest of that season and helped the Phils get to the playoffs. And, of course, 32 years old when he came in and you know, one of the great stories of someone getting a shot in the majors and really making himself known for, you know, he was able to keep in the majors for a couple of years uh, after getting a shot. Pretty great story. Yeah. 
the, the Phillies backup catchers are usually ones you can root for, it seems like. Um, you throw Eric Kratz more recently into the mix, and, you know, you like to see these guys succeed. And it takes a certain mentality to be catcher, too, so I think they may have that personality, that leadership um, mentality that you need. So, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons, too. But the Phillies have had some luck with, with their catching, uh, both starting and, and backups, for sure. Well, hopefully that luck will continue. Cameron are up some pretty decent offensively. Defensively is a different story, as we talked about earlier in the show. But Jorge Alfaro, who knows? Maybe he'll be the guy. There's been some Pudge Rodriguez comparisons. That would be incredible. I think I would be looking for, I don't know, uh, J.J. Realmuto or something like that right now, or J.J. Realmuto uh, at this point. But, uh, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with him going forward, and maybe we'll have another entrant of the top 100 Phillies list in a couple of years to put on there. Brian, thanks for coming on the podcast. Good to have you on. We'll do this again pretty soon. Thanks, Tim. Go Phils. Hey, what's better than spending a warm summer evening watching the stars of tomorrow play baseball? Phillies Nation will invade First Energy Stadium to watch Scott Kingery and the Reading Fightins on Sunday, June 11th at 5 p.m. with a fun group outing for fans of all ages. That's right, 5 p.m. Sunday, June 11th. We have the third baseline where tickets are $30 and include a a two-and-a-half-hour all-you-can-eat barbecue buffet with ribs, chicken, hot dogs, burgers, mac and cheese, and much more. Plus, this is the perfect Father's Day gift as the first 2,000 guys will receive a Fightin's bucket hat, and all fans are invited to play catch on the field after the game. Come see the future of the Phillies today with Phillies Nation, June 11th, 5 p.m. For details, visit philliesnation.com slash events. Again, it's philliesnation.com slash events. As I mentioned in the intro, and this is why we're doing this catcher episode today, Carlos Ruiz is back in town. He is bringing his Seattle Mariners to Citizens Bank Park for the awesome rivalry between the Mariners and the Phillies. Kirsten Swanson is here with me again to talk about Chooch because he's been our guy for so long. And first off, Kirsten, just got to ask you flat out, what is your favorite Carlos Ruiz memory? The moment that jumps out in my mind is the last out of Roy Holiday's no-hitter against the Reds in the 2010 playoffs. The dribbler from Brandon Phillips is just laying it right in front of the plate, and he just fired it down to the first baseline to get Phillips by a hair out. I mean, there was no doubt that Carlos Ruiz was going to let that ball yeah. get by him. There was just no way, and that kind of defined Chooch as a whole to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he – what was really cool about Chooch, I think, was you got to see him develop both as a hitter because he certainly got better and better as his career went on in Philly, but really as a leader – And for someone who, I mean, there was this great Sports Illustrated story uh, some years back when he was on the cover, and this amazing story about how he grew up in Panama and, you know, had to work, 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 work just to get to the, just to be kind of noticed. And then when he was noticed, he had to work, 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 work to get through the system. And he developed as this leader for someone who, you know, speaks sort of a broken English and was always sort of looked down on as a shorter guy, that kind of thing. But guys like Halliday and Lee, I mean, they loved him. Not only right. respected him, but they loved him. And that doesn't happen with a lot of catches. No, for sure. I mean, think about it. I mean, Roy Halliday and Cliff Lee, they were both well-established before they came to Philly. But Carlos Ruiz got the best out of them, especially Roy Halliday. I mean, he was an absolute – he was a Hall of Famer before he even got here. But once he got here, I mean, a perfect game and a no-hitter in one season. And you can just see how Roy Halliday is just – I don't want to say obsessed, but like you said, loved him like a brother, like a sibling. Um, and even later down the line, later in his career before he left, he was such a mentor to the Latin players. Um, I had the pleasure of going to a kind of meet and greet before last season, and Freddie Galvis and Michael Franco were on a panel, and they both could not just stop gushing over Carlos Ruiz. You know, he took them under his wing. He bought them clothes when they first got called up. Um, he was really he was a brother to many of them, but then also like a father later down the line. Yeah, and uh, one of the, Brian Lawrence had a piece about when he, when Chooch went to L.A. last year, he wrote a piece about his favorite memories, or the best memories, and uh, in this story he quoted 
Chooch from the no-hitter, and apparently Chooch was spending the entire no-hitter talking to Danny Baez, which, Interesting. I mean, I guess he's the guy, you know, you can both speak Spanish, you can relate to each other, what have you. Right. Um, but it's just, you know, it, it, like, he was able to kind of pick and choose and find the right people to, you know, uh, work with, and, and everybody loved Chooch, as you said. I mean, he was such a such an amazing uh, leader for this team and came out of nowhere. I mean, my, I think about, because the catching and the, and the World Series and all that has always been the moment for everybody. I think about the I think about the hitting, and 2011, I think he had that unbelievable season where he hit like 320 or something like that. Yeah, was that his All Star? That was his, uh, that was the All Star season, I believe. It was 11? Yeah. It was 12. It was 2012. 2012. Because the the Phillies were bad as a team. Chooch was really good as a player. Right. Um, and I also think of remember when he uh, beat Johnny Broxton. In I think 2009, oh, yeah, sure. uh, in that like insane comeback where they scored a bunch of runs in the eighth and ninth inning to beat to beat Broxton. I mean, he, is that where he got his Chooch Tober uh, nickname? The Ch- Chooch Tober was because of 2008, I believe, right? Because he because he uh, he was just kind of in the mix, like the game that's three, right, right, game yeah. three of the 2008 World Series when he hit the squib that won the game. Yes, he, for sure. He was always on in the postseason. I'll draw him up real quick. Um, postseason stats for Chooch. I mean, look at these numbers. 2007, NLDS against Colorado. He had 333 with a 400 OBP. 2008, NLCS, 313, 353 OBP, 375 slugging percentage. He had a double, five hits, what have you, against the Dodgers. World Series against Tampa, 375 with a 500 on base percentage, 688 slugging percentage. Got to the plate 20 times. And we had four walks and uh, six hits. So he got on base half the time. Uh, of the 20 plate appearances, had a home run in the World Series that I believe was in Game Five of the World or Game Four of the World Series when they they, they had the big breakout, um, and it continued. 2009 NLDS 308 average, 385 in the NLCS, 333 in the World Series, uh, and then he went 500 in the in the NLDS this past year for the Dodgers. For his career, his World Series average is 353 with a 488 on base percentage. He has That's just insanity. I mean, it's unbelievable how he just turned it on late in the season. So you always knew that he had this instinct. And one of the better fastball hitters I think we've ever seen. I mean, the guy could just attack, attack, attack. I mean, Chooch be comes to my mind. I always think I'm behind the plate commanding the, the games. But, like, you just run down that list of just his postseason numbers. And it's just, he, I think he, I'm not a big fan of the word clutch. But if I think of Carlos Ruiz in, especially the postseason, he was clutch. He he wanted that moment to shine. He worked, like you said, he worked hard. He worked hard to make it up to where he was, and he wasn't going to let any moment get it slip up, slip by him. Yeah, 2012, he hit 325 with a 394 on base percentage, 540 <laughs> slug, 16 homers in 114 games. So he put up, he literally put up Joey Votto numbers in 114 games in 2012. He finished 28th in the MVP voting. He actually finished his worst MVP uh, voting finish in his career. He finished 17th in the voting in 2010 when he hit 302. I mean, the guy in that three- or four-year run between 2010 and, let's say, 13 was unstoppable at the point. <laughs> and he finished with a 265 average, uh, 266 with the Phillies, and right now he's 265. Not hitting so well in Seattle, so I beg the question for you, Kirsten. Do you think this could be it for Carlos Ruiz this last year in Seattle? I think so, and I don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, but I hope so. You know, you don't want to see the likes of Ryan Howard who's struggling in AAA with the Braves. You want them to go out. He's not out on top, but you don't want him to be just lingering around going from team to team. Um, I I would like to see Carlos, you know, turn it up a notch a little bit in Seattle and hopefully get them to turn it around as well. But I would like to see him go out, you know, on a high note. Yeah, I, I – Get a weird feeling that he, I mean, he'll probably get a start in Philly either tonight or tomorrow. I would assume that the Mariners would probably do that. And I'm assuming he's going to do something. He'll, he'll hit a double or a homer or something. And because that's how it always works. Chase Utley, every time right. he comes back to Citizens Bank Park, like hits two homers or something. By the way, Utley's not hitting too well right now for the Dodgers. And Hamels is hurt right now. So have, the world is falling apart from 2008 Phillies. Um, yep. And Kyle Kendrick is still. Trying really hard to make it the major yeah. It's funny how this world works. Yeah, boy. Uh, maybe when they play Boston, he'll find his way back this year, and maybe he'll shut out the Phillies. It could happen. It really could happen. 
Um, Kirsten, I, I'm excited to see Carlos come back and, and the standing ovation will be insane. It might be as good as the, the Chase Utley one. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, it'll be fun to watch him. So thanks for coming on and sharing some Tooch memories. Thanks, Tim. My thanks again to Kirsten Swanson for talking about Chooch and the current catching situation with the Phillies. Also, thanks to Brian Michael for coming on and talking about some history. Thanks to BenSound.com for the music for the show. We'd love your music. Please write to me at Tim at PhilliesNation.com or tweet me at Timothy Malcolm. We'd love to get your music on the podcast for intros and bumpers and all that fun stuff. If you're a local musician, it's an awesome opportunity for you. We have a lot of listeners. I think they're in the hundreds. They might be more, hopefully, at this point. So, again, a local musician, please get in touch because it would be great to have you on the podcast. Meanwhile, I have to bring it up again, your minor league report. Lakewood is having a great season. Their rotation is quite good. Nick Fonte, the... Most recent spotlight starter for the Blue Claws, pitching eight and two thirds no hitter. He was relieved and the no hitter was secured. Right now he has a 1.48 ERA with 31 strikeouts and 10 walks. Pretty solid numbers. Meanwhile, Ranger Suarez continues to have an outstanding season. 37 strikeouts and seven walks in 29 innings. ERA under one. 6-0. He got hit a little bit on Sunday, but he's still pitching well. His uh, strikeout-to-walk ratio is quite good. I think it's somewhere in the 8s or 9s or even 10s at this point. He's just outstanding. You can find the podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, on Stitcher, on Spreaker, on iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio, also YouTube, at the Phillies Nation YouTube at youtube.com slash Phillies Nation. I should say iHeartRadio soon, TuneIn Radio now for sure. And go to philliesnation.com for all your news, rumors, information, and opinion, and more on the Philadelphia Phillies. We will see you next week and hopefully a few more wins to talk about. Not two, okay? More wins, more good play. Clean it up. Let's go. For the Phillies Nation Podcast, I'm Tim Malcolm. See you next week.